to accept that I don't have that control and to focus on the things I can control, which is my perspective, my attitude, my work ethic, how I want to move forward and honor those who aren't here. I think if we could really just sat down and focused on those things and how we wanted to treat others. And we really just sat and thought with that and actually took a step forward in that direction. We'd be able to heal from tougher situations and uh, understand. But the big thing is the key piece that's missing is acceptance. And I think that we have to accept what has happened. And some of us never do get to that point. Some of us do get to that point. And some of us still have those why questions and knowing that for me personally, I had lots of why questions. Why am I still here? Why are others not? How come this person behind me isn't here when I was in front of them? How like, how does this make sense? Why did this even have to happen? Why, why all of these whys? But sometimes you'll never get an answer. And that's why I've learned to accept. And I think the acceptance piece is a big one for me in the healing process of moving forward. That was Caleb Dahlgren, Humboldt Broncos bus crash survivor and author of a fantastic book called Crossroads. And you are listening to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Podolan. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Podolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello and welcome back to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Podolan. I am your host, Jason Podolan, and today we have on another fantastic guest. It's a guest that is inspiring countless people with his new book, Crossroads, and the author of that book is Caleb Dahlgren. Caleb was a survivor of the crash on April 6, 2018, that the humble Broncos were on trying to come back in a playoff series against Nippon, and that bus never made it to the game. And I'm sure you've heard the story. Uh, if you're at all involved in hockey, it was a story that uh, rippled through the entire world um, because of its size and magnitude and loss and how it was able to touch so many people in so many different ways. And and a tragedy that took the lives of 16 people on the bus that day. Uh, Caleb was one of the survivors, and Caleb was is able to write about his experiences and, uh, you know, preceding the crash and how he's moved on after. And this book is powerful. Powerful in ways that you might not expect. And I do encourage you uh, as of right now that if you have not read this book called Crossroads, that you need to read it. It's essentially a handbook uh, on what is possible, I believe, um, by how you choose how you choose to tell the story of the events that happened to you. We talk about that a little bit in this episode. Um, there's a lot of things that Caleb could not control with that bus crash. He couldn't control where they were, who was driving it, what the semi driver did. I mean, the list goes on and on. He did have control over, though, what he chose to to focus on as the meaning was of that crash, where his place was in it. He was able to focus on how can I turn this into something positive? How can I turn in, turn this into something I can be of service for? And something that was so tragic and hit him more profoundly, you know, than, than anyone else, he was on the bus, you know, he was able to use a belief system that he had started to cultivate prior to the crash. That was a part of his DNA and part of his makeup to move forward from something that is immensely tragic and sad and all these other negative terms that we want to put on it. But he has turned this into a light and he has been able to celebrate and honor those that were on the team, those that 
weren't fortunate enough to make it. And he has chosen to write this book and to give people the ability to see that perspective is our choice. And, uh, and we can choose to celebrate those, um, and the memories of those, or we can be sad and we can think that they should still be here and we can have resistance to what has happened. Um, this is not meant to be a therapy session. It isn't, uh, It's just, it's profound, I believe, the power of our decisions and our choices that really rest on a belief system of how we choose to respond to situations. Uh, And Caleb has done a fantastic job of showing that, you know what, it is possible and we can move forward and we can move on. And his light and his guidance uh, is helping others uh, all over this planet with with his story and with his uh, with his re- resiliency. He, as I say in the in the in the interview, he he seems he seems too good to be true. He seems like this can't be real. This can't be serious. Um, but he is real, and he is serious, and he is authentic, and. It was a pleasure to spend 60 minutes with him. I've never spoken to him before this conversation. Uh, I had read the book. I had heard of him uh, from people like Chris Joseph uh, and others who who have got to know him or knew him. And uh, and yeah, he's the real deal. This is this is Caleb, uh, in all of his light and all of his um, positivity and optimism and. Uh, and gratitude. I think that's really the biggest thing. Like grateful, grateful for knowing those players on the bus, grateful for having an opportunity to move forward and to live for them. Grateful for the people that, you know, support him and teams throughout Canada and, you know, the lives of others and, and being of service. It's just such an awesome reminder to all of us, uh, that there is meaning in every day. And there's meaning in every event and it can be a positive one if we want it to be set to be so. So, uh, yeah, there's my preamble to a really powerful conversation and to a really powerful book. Crossroads is something that you should read. Um, Crossroads is a book that you should buy for others. Um, Crossroads is in honor of those who perished. And I believe it is a shining example of something positive that can come out of something so tragic. So without further ado, I bring you Caleb Dahlgren. All right. Um, that's one thing I didn't actually tell you. And as I press the live button, um, I think I put it in the email, but we are going to be live. Uh, I have a Facebook group here called uh, Up My Hockey, which is a parent group that has almost 1300 members in it now from across uh, the United States and Canada, uh, all on their own journeys. And I, like we talked briefly before, and that's kind of where this whole thing started for me. Like the Genesis was how to help others go and get to where either they want to go or where I was and, and, and want, you know, and then they want to get there too and help their, help their players. And, um, I thought this was like absolutely perfect, meaning your book, um, as far as the context in it, the content in it, the message in it is uh, absolutely, absolutely rings true for uh, for some of the things that we talk about in this group, and and I think it's awesome for young players to be able to uh, to listen to it. So, without further ado, I want to welcome Caleb Dahlgren, um, author of Crossroads, uh, to to the podcast at my hockey. Thanks for coming, Caleb. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. I'm really looking forward to this, and thank you for bringing me on. Appreciate hey, it. No worries. I. Uh, I can respect. I mean, I heard I heard your story. Um, well, I knew Crossroads existed, but then I we listened to the NHL Network a lot coming in uh, to hockey practices with my three boys. I have three boys, and we're in and out for spring hockey, and and the NHL Network's usually on. And and we heard about a fifteen minute interview with you uh, there on one of the morning programs, mm-hmm. and uh, and then someone in the group posted uh, a picture with with your book, saying what a great read it was, and they suggested everyone else read it. And I was like, well, maybe I should try and interview Caleb. And then there was like a resounding kind of response of, yeah, you know, see if you can get him on. So anyways, the crazy, the way the social media works now, I reached out to you on Instagram, just for those of you listening. Um, and Caleb got back to me, uh, you know, with your, you know, gratefulness and saying, yeah, I'd love to do it. But we out to the publicist. And anyways, and so here we are. I mean, now we're chatting about the book that I, that I have read. And um, 
and impacted me and I'm sure it's impacting others. And what, what is the response right now, the general response of like the impact of this book on people you've, you've spoke to about it? Thank you. I appreciate it. There's been a pretty profound effect. Um, I, I wasn't expecting it to be honest. I hopefully, I hope for it. And I was just hoping that it would connect with people, but a uh, lot of people have said that it's really changed their life or changed their perspective. Um, have made have been really really reflect and think about things that they may never thought about before, um, and also even challenges some of their beliefs too about how they are. Like one example, a person said that they challenged their beliefs with death and why am I so sad about why when I celebrate the life that I was with and yeah, so some of those things and then even like the suicide aspect about how some people aren't as suicidal or it has helped them cope with their uh, suicidal th feelings and thoughts. It's actually, it's been, yeah, it's been pretty crazy. And uh, I'm just honored to have that kind of experience and people will actually connect with it that on that deep of a level. So um, yeah, that was a whole goal. And to actually have my goal be met, I think it deems it success in my eyes. It's not how many books I sell, it's how many people I connect with. Yeah, well, well said. And a part of that, I mean, I was wondering, oh, and by the way, I, I have a connection. Jeez, I don't want to do this to you. I do have a connection a bit to the crash, meaning that I played with Chris Joseph. And uh, and obviously, Jackson, as you know, is a teammate who, who uh, didn't make it through. And so uh, everyone has their own connection to this thing and in different ways. Um, and so there was a layer there that I think in my own head and my own grieving, like, struck me you know obviously i was a kid that was on a bus i was a pro i was on a bus you know i mean we can all go there sports teams being yeah. a hockey player traveling across the prairies so then you have a teammate that you really love and you respect and you knew what you know he was about as far as family first and jackson was running around in our dressing room in Mannheim, you know back when we used to play together and i saw him grow up over three years and you know never met him as a young man but i mean all that really was like this whirlwind of of you know emotion for me right uh, and then reading again it, it was go going through it again but he spoke about we spoke about the book a little bit and like and he said just how respectful you were with it you know that like you wanted to do this but he definitely gave you gave you praise and respect for the fact that like you contacted everybody and you wanted them to know about what this meant to you and how you wanted to go about it and even I mean maybe approvals the wrong word but like wanted kind of consent right it sounded like that you wanted to make sure that this was right can you talk about that process because i'm sure like the human aspect of that you you I mean you understood the gravitas of what you were about to embark on and you wanted to make sure people were we're understanding your intentions. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So I really wanted to make sure. And for me, that was one of the hard parts about even writing the book was how is it going to impact them? Because obviously my life isn't all about me being a Bronco, but I know a portion of this book will be about that because that was one of the biggest things that had happened in my life was the effect of the Broncos crash. And it's changed my life. It's changed everyone's life on that bus. And even externally from that bus, it's changed lots of people's lives. So I knew that that was going to be a touchy topic for sure. And I really wanted to honor everybody that was on the team and try to get everyone's name in there um, who was a part of the Broncos. And even the tribute chapter itself for the 16 who aren't here, that was probably one of the biggest things for me too that I really wanted to do. And so I sent off every single piece that I wrote to the individual family. So I sent off Jackson's to the Joseph family and uh, said, you can tweak it, you can edit it, do whatever you want. Um, I'm more than happy. This is my thoughts and how I perceived um, Jackson to be to me and uh, some things I really admired in him. And I know this isn't a complete picture. It's like just time frame that I was with him. And it's literally just a couple a chat, like a paragraph or two. And I know it's not going to be complete, but I want to mention him and honor his legacy that he had an impact that he had on me too. And so I think that was one of the big things I wanted to make sure that all of them were okay with what I wrote about their ones that are here today. Yeah, super respectful. And uh, I know I know the Joseph family did appreciate it. And they they couldn't speak, you know, loudly enough about this the specialness of the group and even the families involved in that group, you know, like you know, Chris definitely believes that, you know, a, a the parental system and the family system creates the people within it, you know, and, and he said that they're like the, the young men on that team were solid men. And he said that was a tribute he felt to, to the parents that were there as well, raising them. So when something like that struck, like the people that got together to know each other, it was, uh, you know, it was a special, 
It, it was a special group that will ever, for, forever be connected for sure. Uh, you mentioned words that I wanted to get into already, like perspective and beliefs and um, what those things mean. And I think that there is power in perspective because bringing in that family unit again, I mean, if you're not exposed to things or ways of thinking, it can be completely foreign and not even on your radar that it, you can comprehend something a certain way. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that I do talk about in Up My Hockey when it comes to, I mean, similar things, but this idea of this a belief system that makes us up as people that allows us to go to the rink and show up a certain way, that allows us to go to charity events and show up a certain way, that a lot of these things are built off beliefs and we can change our beliefs. It seems to me, uh, reading from the book, that a lot of your belief system was wired before this even happened, right, to be, you know, for lack of a better word, a empty uh, analysis here, but the glass is half full. Like that that was the way that you were brought up or that's the way that you were wired. How much do you think was nurture and how much do you think was nature when it came to that overall outlook for you? I'd say definitely quite a bit was, yeah, I say half and half, honestly. I think for me, I was fortunate enough to have such a great support system and parents who were the type of people that led by example with the glass half full. And I did try to find the positives in every situation. And I had tons of people in my support system who were positive people who would try to find the best light in the worst times. And one example, even in the book, was my personal trainer, Chad Martin. I didn't even realize he was suffering with cancer and a brain tumor and brain cancer, sorry. And he literally lived his life to the fullest and was treating everyone how he wanted to be treated. And then to find out like a month or two before he passed away that he was battling brain cancer was a shock. So he literally didn't look act like he lived with it. He was his same self, always happy, always upbeat, always wanted to make you feel special and treat you like how you wanted to be treated. And that was one of the big things for me that really stood out was just the impact that he had on me at that age and molding me into the person I am. And then even the fact that I should have passed away if I was with my dad in his vehicle um, and then we got hit and he got in his accident, I would have been gone too. And just kind of how fast life can just change and to really just enjoy it because life life can go an instant and i knew that even at a young age losing my teammate um so i really i had this definitely throughout my my life i'd say just through the people i had but then also inside of me too i'm the kind of person who thinks why wouldn't i try to have a happy life like it's not fun having a negative life and if you do focus on negative nothing positive ever happens because you're only thinking on the negatives and so for me, that was one of the big things was being a diabetic and being told you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, I tried to focus on the positives in that time and really just tried to say, hey, you know what? I can still do this. I can still do that. Um, I'm going to try to make the most of the situation given. And people already have made the most of it. Like Bobby Clark is one of them who has done amazing things. And it was a trailblazer. But um, I think that for sure it was inside of me too but I want to say I give credit to my people, my support systems, because I really truly think they helped made me the person I am today. Yeah. What a wild time with your father and what he went through. And I don't want to, I don't want to really cover the book point for point. Cause I want to give people a reason to read it, but you know, that was, you know, did, did it, did it ever get connected to that crash was what happened to your dad? Like, was it the crash, the, the impetus for, for the disease that he ended up having? They think so. I think that, uh, Due to that, it onset the illness. And so normally there's some big, I guess, catastrophic event. And even with my diabetes, I had the chicken pox, I believe, and then the flu. And then they think the flu onset my diabetes. Wow. And so it's the same kind of thing um, with his case too. They think the accident onset his sarcoidosis. Because you had, I mean, for lack of a better term, like a kind of a tra trial run with like how to deal with living a full life, as you call it, while there's somebody close to you who's not living a great life, right? Who's sick, who's at home. You had to leave leave for hockey or you had the choice to leave for hockey. But it sounded like, again, in that in those in those words that you used, that that is exactly what your father wanted you to do. And, and if you held that close enough, and even if you put it – put the shoe on the other foot and said, if I was in this situation, which seems to be like kind of a skill that you use sometimes, right? Like how would I want others to act in this scenario? Um, is that accurate? I 100% accurate. And that's exactly the skill I still use today is to put myself in the shoes of other people and really empathize with them and see where they are at in their life too. 
And for me, that was one of the big things I learned at a younger age was, yeah, when I moved away when I was 16, he wanted me so badly to go and chase my dreams. He didn't want to hold me back. And he said, like, this is what you've been working for. This is one step in your hockey process. This is going to help you develop. He's like, you got to go. You're going to mature. You're going to be a better person when you leave. And when you come back, you'll be that much more mature. He said, this is going to just be an impact for you. And um, so that was, it was definitely difficult though, especially leaving when your dad is one of your best friends in life. And you know that your mom is struggling too, to try to help him. And that summer was difficult for lots of reasons because I wouldn't even go and hang with my friends. That's how severe it was. I'd have to take care of him. And if I did leave him for a long time, I'd feel terrible. So um, yeah, it was definitely a challenging summer for us all. And uh, it, it was, yeah, I, I, I want to say it was a perspective that really helped me throughout that process. Right. What was there like a point in time there? Because you know, you talk about the the debating, right? The internal kind of conflict of should I go, should I not go? How did you get to a point of peace with it? Like, was there was there a turning point at, at any at any spot in that summer? I think the turning point for me was just him continually saying, like, "Hey, this is what you've done. This is what I want you to do. Just go and do it." And he said, "Life is too short, and you know that is too short." And if you don't do this, you'll be kicking yourself for not going. Right. And he was right. And that was kind of where I came in for perspective where I lost my teammate. I lost my personal trainer. I know how fast that life can change. And that if I didn't go and try this out, I would regret it probably. At the same time, would I regret it if my dad passed away? Maybe. But I would have known I was chasing my dream. And that that's what he would have wanted me. So I would have felt comfortable with that. Right. In his honor, right? Chasing exactly. your dream in his honor. And that was uh, exactly it. Like I even used it as motivation too. And that was another aspect where I kind of was like, you know what? I'm going to play the season for my dad. And then I want to do the best I can for him too. And to show that I should be there and I should be on this team and I should be doing well. You talked about your trainer. You brought him up. And I wasn't sure if I was going to, but since you did, I, I, I think that there is an interesting piece there that maybe the casual listener or maybe the casual sports uh you know weekend kind of warrior doesn't quite get but is that idea of the the not no pain no gain but the idea of understanding like limits and that we are in a sense limitless and yeah. how when you can explore that that barrier that mental physical barrier that's usually it's in our head like yeah. that can be so useful, not only in your training and trying to develop your physical body, but once you've proven to yourself that, oh, it does lie between my ears, you know, like that you're able to construct kind of a belief system or a perspective that can enable you in other ways. It, was that sort of your first taste of that at, at that point in time? Yeah, it was for sure my first taste. And when I felt the lactic acid, I was like, this hurts so much. What's going on? And he's like, oh, it's good for you. And that was such a good mindset switch where I was like, oh, it's so painful, it hurts. He's like, no, it's good for you. It's like fuel. And then that was like, okay, you're right. I do need to switch my mindset on this. I need to be like, oh, this is great. I'm going to be better every time I feel this, that I should be feeling this way because I know the next day I'm going to be better. And so um, that was just a perspective switch in that little sentence really can make a difference. But some people just put it off and like, oh, whatever. But if you actually think about it and when these things do happen, you actually reflect and sit on it and like, okay, this does make sense. And I do need to have this right mindset around this atmosphere or sorry, aspect. Right. Yeah. I mean, because you said it's just a small perspective, but it is, it, it hurts, right? When we're just talking about that physical, like psychological barrier, right? It hurts. Your brain's telling you to stop because it hurts. That's kind of what our physiology is told to do. But when we actually understand that, no, this is helpful or I am able to do more the, at least for me, like that was like the competitive juices got going, right? Like yeah. how far can I go? Are you familiar with Dave Goggins at all? David Goggins? Yes. Yeah, I am. Did you yeah. read his book? I have not read his book. No. Oh my God. Talking about taking it to the nth level. Like that's like exploring boundaries. Like it's, I'm sure you'd resonate. I mean, not maybe with his cuss words that he uses all the time, but you would resonate with, with his message, I think about uh, what we're capable of and we keep pushing our boundaries. He, he's been said that he's been quoted that he thinks that we're operating at about 40% as a, as a human race. Huh. Interesting. He, he thinks there's like 60% left for most, for, for most of us. And like, um, and when you start thinking about that, like how often we do stop at comfort zone one, 
right? And and if we push, it's not too far, but really we're capable of more and more and more. Um, he really challenged my perspective actually with that a lot, as, as did you, because, and it seems like you have with others as well, because that that is that perspective. Like, why isn't it a celebration instead of guilt, shame, yeah. right? Like all these other things that come in. It, it, but you, you talked about grieving and I'll just go there because that's where my head went, that you said that everyone has a different process. And the fact that you are doing well, right? That you are uh, moved on is not the right word. You always said there will be a scar there, but the fact that you are able to use this as something to be positive, right? Something to be of service with. Um, have you ever felt resentment from that, from people that are having a hard time moving on? That like, how come you get to feel this way and I feel the other way? Because Chris Joseph kind of spoke about that even within his own family, right? That some people would have a good day. And if you're having a bad day, when somebody's having a good day, it's hard not to feel like, how are you feeling so good? I feel terrible. Do you know what I mean? Like that whole dynamic could be, can be kind of weird. Yeah, for sure. And I have had people question it. And even like I said in the book, how the psychologist was like, what do you mean you have this perspective? And uh, it doesn't make sense to some people, but to others, it does make sense. And that's okay. And I understand that we're not all wired the same and we are all different beings on this earth and there's nothing wrong with that. And so what works for me may not work for someone, but I, I think I have for sure felt that um, in different instances. But at the same time, I understand that everybody does heal differently and that there is no right or wrong way either. It's not that my way works and your way doesn't. There's no right or wrong way. And that it may take longer for other people or it may take less for others. And that's completely fine. And that's life. Do you feel it can work? Now, I mean, I'm talking the therapy aspect of getting over grief, which I have zero uh, credibility in, you know, but... Do you think like that the way like do you, do you think that if you can harness your perspective that this could be a tool for others like that it is available to them? Do you think it can work for everybody? I, I don't think it works for everybody, but I think it can work for sure, and it has worked for me. And some of the stuff that I even focus on is controlling things I can control, and it's such a hard topic to even think about. Uh, well, maybe not think about, but to actually do because we are so we're thrown with so many different things in life. An example right now, pandemic. Um, we do have some control, but we don't have a lot. And I'll just use the example in the book um, as the easiest example so people can relate to is a crash. I literally don't have any control of the semi driver going through the stop sign. I don't have control of who made it, who didn't. I don't have control of my injuries. I don't even have control of um, what's going on in next week after my, or I could hit my head and something could happen. So I really don't have much control in life and we really don't. And we all want control in life or some of us do, most of us want control in life. And to accept that I don't have that control and to focus on the things I can control, which is my perspective, my attitude, my work ethic, how I wanna move forward and honor those who aren't here. I think if we could really just sat down and focused on those things and how we wanted to treat others. And we really just sat and thought with that and actually took a step forward in that direction, we'd be able to heal from tougher situations and. I understand. But the big thing is the key piece that's missing is acceptance. And I think that we have to accept what has happened. And some of us never do get to that point. Some of us do get to that point. And some of us still have those why questions. And knowing that for me personally, I had lots of why questions. Why am I still here? Why are others not? How come this person behind me isn't here when I was in front of them? How, like, how does this make sense? Why did this even have to happen? Why, why all of these whys, but sometimes you'll never get an answer. And that's why I've learned to accept. And I think the acceptance piece is a big one for me in the healing process of moving forward. I just want to take a quick break to thank you for listening. Also to thank Caleb for writing the book. Uh, and for coming on and being a guest here. Caleb, if you are listening to this, uh, your time is much appreciated. Uh, your time writing that is also appreciated. I think you've given a gift to humanity uh, that a lot of people don't see the world the way you do. And I believe that we can all see the world the way you do. And we can try and live the way you live. And I think that the example you are setting and the way you have written about it uh is is really powerful and and it's a tool 
uh, for others to follow and to see what's possible. So I know it's a stretch for some of us. I know when the times are darkest, it can be really hard to try and find a meaning that makes sense. The ability for us to tell a story about the circumstances that lift us up, that give positive meaning and a positive focus. But we do create our environment. I'm a, I'm a firm believer of that. And uh, I think Caleb does a great job of, of showing us how. So thank you for listening today. Uh, thank you for being here for this episode. Uh, I, hope, I hope it helps you or it helps a family member in some way to help with the perspective to see, to see how our choices uh, matter and how we are empowered. We do have the authority to make those choices. And uh, Caleb, keep doing what you're doing, man. Uh, I think... I think what you're doing is fantastic. I uh, I believe the book, I'm sure it was cathartic in writing it. I'm sure there was an element of therapy in there, but I do believe that it was done with the intention of uh, of helping. And that seems to be what you're all about. And I know, uh, I know you have helped others. I know it's helped me. It's helped solidify me and my belief of what I think is possible, not only for, you know, athletes, hockey players who want to get somewhere, but also from the human perspective of trying to become... Um, more resilient, more emotionally sound people to be creating an environment in the universe uh, in our own individual daily lives that has meaning and purpose and, and that we can be grateful for. So thanks again. Um, thanks for listening. If you enjoy this episode, please give a comment uh, or give a review or share with somebody. Uh, I That is the one way to grow this podcast and allow Caleb's story to be heard even more. And also, of course, um, support Caleb in the book and uh and what he stands for here with the proceeds going to stars which is you know who came to that crash site and who helps people every day uh when times are the worst so um double barrel uh, reason here to go purchase the book uh now back to the episode with caleb dahlgren yeah man well said like acceptance is such a big word and i've i mean i i've used it with my own kids in a much more you know unprofound way but it's it's like my one kid's a goalie. You you let in a goal you don't like. Yeah. You don't have to. You need to accept it. You don't have to like it. Yeah. Right. Like that's the difference, right? Like you, you have to understand the difference between those two things. Like accepting it is one thing. You do not have to like it. No one has to tell you you like the crash. No one has to tell you anything that you like anything. But you do have to accept that it existed, right? Yeah. And like that in and of itself then loses the resistance. I think around that event, you know, and the resistance I think is what really hurts us. Um, I want to expand a little bit on how you said there, like, so the crash, the things you can, can't control because it's crazy how much it mirrors what I call my mindset 101, where I talk about, I do talk about an event and I use COVID in my event and in, in like in my training where, cause it's so, it's so real to most people, right. And to most hockey players. So this COVID thing happens, right. And there's, it's a natural response for the majority of hockey players to say, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't. And so what does that do? Right. It changes your emotions. It yep. changes your thoughts. It changes your actions. And then it also gives you results from that whole, yep. that whole train. Right. And my whole thing was like, what if we say like, what, what can I do because of COVID? Like yep. what, what am I allowed to work on now that I couldn't otherwise? What, where's my advantage here that others aren't seeing? Right. And then all of a sudden you start seeing clues, the opposite direction. And guess what? That changes your emotions. It changes your thoughts. It changes your action, changes your results. Right. Like yep. it's, it sounds like that's what you're talking about. Right. Because yeah. that, yeah, because that crash, you've turned into being a positive. What is good about this? How can I honor these people? How can I move forward? How can I give back? And your focus seems to have allowed you to do that and to impact others. So I don't know. Can you maybe add some color to that at all, like about that choice and how there is one there? Yeah. Oh, there is definitely. And the thing is, there's a quote out there that says, life is 10% happens to you, 90% how you react to it. And I've always lived by that quote and maybe it's not the percentages are the same whatever but it is true because in every situation we can control how we want to react to it any situation any situation we can control how we want to react to it and our choice afterwards really dictates our future and that's kind of the whole idea behind even the crossroads aspect was that we are faced with these life situations that put us in the middle of a crossroad and we can either choose to go down the positive path or down the negative path or just choose any path that we want to go down. And for me, I wanted to choose a positive path in the right and bright section and try to find light in the darkness. And there really wasn't much positivity coming out of the crash, not gonna lie, but I tried to make some positive things out of it. 
And one of the things was just being grateful for the aspect of having known these people on the bus and having to develop a relationship with them. And even grateful that I still have an opportunity to live today and to live for myself, but also for the 16 who aren't here too, and to make the most of my time while I have it. And like you said, we have to focus on what we can control. And so I did work on my beliefs and my attitude and my work ethic and how I wanted to recover from this and what I wanted to do moving forward to honor them and to also honor myself and follow my passions and dreams. Right. And then like you said, where you put yourself in their shoes, that was a big one for me too, where I was like, if I'm not here on this earth, how would I want others to live? Would I want them to be sad, to grieve with about me and to not live their life to the fullest or to have hurt in their life? No, I'd want them to be happy, to enjoy life to the fullest, to remember me, to celebrate me, to make the most of their memories and to really enjoy life because it, it can be gone fast. So I think it's a, it's a pretty big perspective, but I think once people get to that point, they can find some healing. Yeah. Thank you for that. And for those who just joined, like I said, we are, we are live here. It seems like it actually didn't go live in the group, but I'm live on my Facebook channel. And by all means, if you have a question for Caleb, those joining in, thank you for joining and sharing in his story. Um, Caleb, you know, I read in your book that you always be remembered as a humble Bronco survivor. And there I have it all across the, the ticker at the bottom, right? I mean, one, you're a fantastic human being. And maybe I should have put that there, Caleb Dahlgren, fantastic human being, because you, I mean, you're a star, you're a star example. And, but so much so, I'm going to tell you a funny story because that first interview I told, that I listened to you, right, on the NHL network, I got off that 15 minutes being like one of those psychologists that talked to you, right? I was like, this guy's too good to be true. Like this, there's no way, there's no way this is real. Like I wasn't that defiant, but like, it was like, you just come across as like, wow, man, like these people actually exist. Like you can be this positive and have this type of an outlook. And then when I talked to Chris Joseph again, he's like, um, that is so surreal to me. Like how that even works, right? Like that. And maybe I'll let you tell it, but I mean, it sounds like you are, I mean, a freak of medical history, really. Like what has happened to your brain, sh you yeah. shouldn't be doing what you're doing. Yet the one thing that was affected the most was like this natural beauty of your empathy, right? Which went on hold for a while, almost like to recover and come back even stronger. Uh, yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about the lesions and the bleeds and kind of what that little time was like for yourself and your parents? Yeah. So I suffered, uh, I'll go through all my injuries. So I suffered a severe traumatic brain injury and a fractured skull, punch wound to my skull, a skeletal gloving. So this whole side of my head was completely shaved off. I saw some scars here, but I'm also balding too, so that probably doesn't help. Um, <laughs> I just have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Broken neck, broken back, um, blood clots in my left arm, right eardrum, uh, muscle, nerve, ligament damage in my neck and my back. Um, but other than that, that was all the injuries. I, I probably had a broken nose too, not gonna lie. I have better breathing now, so I feel like it was broken. Um, <laughs> but uh, for me, I, the biggest thing was my brain injury and just how severe it was. And so I don't remember four and a half days of being in the hospital right after the crash. I remember everything right up to the crash and then everything went black. And so I don't remember those four and a half days. And in those four and a half days, I was actually talking, walking, uh, meeting people, but I had this flat affect on my face and I was very vulgar, I was disrespectful, rude. I was so uncharacteristic of myself that it was actually quite scary for a lot of the people who did know me and knew me before. And they're like, this is so unlike Caleb. And I would be swearing and yeah, so it was really bad. And I didn't really get, I'd say fully better. I was able to control it better later on in the hospital, but it wasn't fully better until maybe June, July, um, probably June, I'd say it was when I was actually kind of more myself. Um, but yeah, that was due to the brain injury that I had. And yeah, I did not, I was not empathetic at all. I was disrespectful to quite a few people who I would never, ever be respectful to or to, never to anyone, honestly. Yeah. And um, so that was definitely challenging. And then coming back, I, I, yeah, I just kind of became myself, like I said, in June. Could you reckon, like, did you recognize you weren't you? Like, was there, did you have that type of self-awareness or did you not know? I, and so over the first four and a half days, I did not know um, at all. I had no idea. And then when I kind of came to my senses and I don't know how to describe it. And I don't know why I came to my senses on that day or how it works. And based, I guess we'll go back with the Marvel 
of the dark doctors. Based on my image of my brain, I shouldn't be able to remember my name, how to walk, how to talk. Um, that's how severe a brain injury it was. And so throughout this whole process, it was difficult. I didn't really know how severe a brain injury it was until I started doing more testing and all that. So I didn't know that, but also I really didn't realize I was different until, oh boy, I'd probably say a week into it. Um, and maybe even a little bit after. And it was when I started getting the pictures and videos of myself. And I was like, is this really me? Like, am I actually telling this? Am I saying this? Am I? And so, yeah. And I saw a picture of me and primary prime minister, Justin Trudeau. And I had no idea he came to visit. I didn't even remember it whatsoever. I was like, I don't remember even meeting him. And my parents were like, oh, you should remember meeting him. I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, you were really rude and didn't want to meet him. And you didn't like him at all. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what? So that was when it really hit me. That was way different. And then I could also feel myself wanting to be more, I was more agitated per se. I was like more high strung and agitated in the hospital. Um, and so then, yeah, by the end of May, I was kind of back to my normal self. But yeah, with the doctors being marveled about it, it was, um, they deemed me as a miracle. Um, and that I have, I honestly have done better on my tests than I did even before the crash. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty under unbelievable I, That's crazy. i'm just very grateful for the opportunity to be in the best shape i possibly can be and uh still live a normal life yeah i was curious about that because I, I either i missed it or i couldn't pick it up i was wondering if it was like a gradual kind of progression back to yourself or was it, was, it like a light switch yeah, it was more um, gradual it was gradual yeah so it was over every day i'd get a little bit better but i when i realized i was different was probably like the first week after the crash Right. Um, when I was in the hospital and I was like super agitated, I was never, ever agitated when I like get mad at certain things I would never get mad at. And it wasn't as easy going as it normally was. Um, so there was definitely a gradual process. Right. Yeah. And more sleep, I think was a big recipe for, was like getting lots of sleep and eating healthy, getting fresh air and getting back to the normal kind of life. And then I was able to kind of become more myself. I think really it was due to the sleep though. You uh, you had a good way of throwing a little bit of comedy in now and again in a very serious topic. And I had to read to I have boys who are 11, 10 and 8. Right. So any type of, uh, you know, poo jokes and pee pee jokes and all that stuff is still pretty funny. So uh, <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll tell the one story there in the book that uh, that got me chuckling when. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Caleb had a catheter in when he first, when the when the crash first started and uh, was like, as he spoke, he was resistant and agitated and thought he should be able to go to the bathroom by himself and all this stuff. And uh, and his dad had just finished and telling him again, I guess, for the second or third time that, no, you can't go to the bathroom. You have a catheter and just let it go. And, you know, and you were kind of shocked. And then shortly thereafter, I guess the doctor comes in and asks Caleb a series of questions to see where he's at and his memory and asked him why, he, if he knew why he was in the hospital. And Caleb says, yes. And the doctor goes, yeah, why is that? And you said, my penis. <laughs> he said, you're here because of your penis. And what did you say? You said, well, I have other issues, but mostly my penis. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that must have been a riot in that room my goodness my kids were dying at breakfast this morning i thought that was pretty good but you obviously you don't remember that right you just that that was told to you after the fact. oh yeah and see like all of these stories in that four and a half day get told to me after and i was like chirping johnny goudreau i was being rude to crosby uh rude to prime minister it was just like kept getting worse and worse and i was like well people probably think i'm a monster right now because this is totally out of my character right uh, yeah, I was even wrapping Eminem in the MRI room as we're waiting to get my MRI. Like it was just, yeah, it was it was different. That is so nuts. Um, I want to move on and talk about the boys a little bit. I mean, you did a you did a fantastic job. I mean, of telling the events that you remember leading up to that moment in time. And uh, and for anyone who's been on a bus, you I mean. The beauty of the bus is the bus is the bus, right? And and the cat calls and the chirps and the questions and you know it's nineteen different guys every time, but it's it's always kind of the same. And so I could definitely relive those moments. It seemed like it seemed like it was a special group even before that happened. Um, and that's what Chris said. That's what Jackson had spoken about. Others on the team have, have said that before. Uh, the crash obviously immortalized that group of individuals um, in a period of time, but. Can you speak about that group? And I want you to speak, if you wouldn't mind, about 
the stuff that you guys did together and like which you were a leader in and I talk about leadership a lot and I talk about the value of inclusiveness and the account of being a good teammate and how these things really do matter like where where in the whole spectrum do you think that like decisions made by the leadership group by the coach um brought those guys together and and, and made you guys special yeah I think for me the first part was that Darcy brought in good people first and then good players second and that was the whole basis of our culture was that we had good people in the dressing room and in the organization so that on ice there would be no issues there'd be no clicks anything like that um obviously you still have your best friends on team and you have your friends and your teammates um so i think that the big thing within our leadership group was that we wanted to connect with everybody and open up the floor to have certain special nights and so uh, we did lost community service as well in the humble community which is another aspect that we were able to really kind of dive deep in and we do like hot lunches at elementary schools where we all wear broncos jerseys and serve lunch to the children play at recess with them or we'd go um, out and skate on ice with a practice so we, we try to do quite a bit or even the community skates too um, we try to do quite a bit in that community to bond together and also bond with the community and the one of my favorites was like the snow shoveling day when we had to mm -hmm. show snow for our community and we played a game the next day afterwards. And then our first game before our last game before playoffs. So um, most hockey people know that last game before playoffs is like, you gotta be dialed in, you gotta be ready to go. Everything's gonna be clicking because playoffs are coming up next. Um, so it was really interesting in that atmosphere of community, but also away from the rink, we would do tons of other stuff and we'd have, I guess, um, bachelor nights i <laughs> love that one that was great, great. <laughs> and then we do like bachelor tv reality tv show we'd watch every monday and there'd be 15 plus guys on our 23 man roster so like i think that goes to show and it was like closer to like i'd say a good 20 all every night every monday that would be there so i think it was just so funny how tight-knit we were and it was I don't think everybody loved the bachelor. I think it was more they loved being with each other. Yeah. And then even Riverdale Thursdays, we do that too. And we also had um, chapel, which would be like team event where we'd go and talk about life lessons and things that we can apply to our team, such as accountability, respect, love. Um, and what are those things and how can we model that within our group? So we did tons of community events and team events. Uh, that really made us close. And then the fact that we all had good people on the team who cared about each other and wanted to spend time with each other was another aspect that uh, I'm very grateful to be a part of. Let's take another short break from the conversation with Caleb. Uh, to let you know, if those of you who are interested, it's, it's amazing talking with Caleb as you're hearing here during this interview. Like there are so many similarities between his approach and his seems like almost natural aptitude for this. And what I have found more through research, trial and error, and, uh, and through teachings that this is possible. And this is what I talk about at my hockey a lot. This is what some of my programs are based around is, is the ability to create a system that supports us in our goals and dreams. And, you know, Caleb, of course, is, has done that. You I mean, his goals and dreams were to help people. And he had to shift some of them because it didn't involve hockey anymore. But he was able to use um, the events of his life and not just the crash, the humble crash. But as you've heard, I mean, the, the, the relationship with his trainer, what happened with his father, his, his diabetes, all these things were reasons or things that could have got in the way, yet he was able to find a meaning that served him that also helped him serve others. Uh, and I believe that's a skill. And I believe that's a skill. And it is one that we talk about it up my hockey. So if you're familiar about what my, if you want to be familiar about what my hockey speaks about, by all means, check out upmyhockey.com. You can see a little bit about my story and what I believe and, and how I believe I can help athletes and hockey players um, become better athletes and become better teammates and be more desirable. And that's something that we talk about in this interview here with Caleb that, 
you know, that was the first question that Darcy asked, what type of a person is he? It was something that I never thought about as a player uh, when I was playing. What type of person is Jason Padolan? What what am I bringing to the table here? Uh, I believe we can have tunnel vision when we're when we're doing anything actually, and and maybe especially a sport. But like you think about your what you're bringing to the team in terms of what skill set you know that I always deem myself as a, a scorer that I was going to score a big goal in the big moment or be a guy you could rely on to to show up in the big games. I never thought about who that person was in the locker room though, or what that person was on the bus and how how my presence on a team was either making it better or making it worse from the human perspective. And these are big things uh, that I think as hockey players, the quicker we understand that, um, it helps us. And not only does it help us, but I mean, it obviously helps in everything. It, it helps you in, in, in your family life. It helps you in your relationships. It helps you anywhere you want to go. So there's no reason not to be talking about it. And uh, and when Darcy Haugen was asking the question, hey, what type of a person is he? There's other there's other coaches that are like that. There's lots of organizations that like that that are thinking about culture and what is happening inside that dressing room to promote high achievement and to promote, you know, the elevation of others. And how do we get more performance out of these players? And it oftentimes comes down to the character traits involved and um, and the approach to the game and the approach to each other that, that makes a huge difference. So... I digress a little bit. If you want to find out more about Up My Hockey, uh, by all means, go to Up My Hockey. You can see what's going on. Uh, there is team services there, an individual. Uh, I've, sp- I've spoken to uh, Caleb after this this interview and uh, got his number. And, you know, our our kind of philosophies align so well. It'd be crazy for us not to do something together. So um, watch for maybe Caleb and I down the road. Who knows what will happen with that? But uh, definitely a firm believer in what he's talking about and his approach. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, in your face reminder that uh that i'm sure that you can apply to something in your life that's like wow what if i just try these principles that he's using here that he has used for himself and see if i can get out of this you know slump dark time relationship issue issue with a coach uh bad relationship with a teacher who knows what that scenario is but try to see if you can give it a powerful meaning what can you learn from it where's the solution for you how can you make this of service to yourself and to others and when you start asking those questions the brain is an amazing an amazing tool it will find answers to the questions you ask so um choose your questions carefully because they turn into things called actions and uh caleb caleb is is showing us how those actions can make a difference so uh i'll bring you back to the interview with caleb dahlgren yeah that's pretty special and it sounds like darcy was a you know, was a special coach. I've talked to hockey people outside of your team, like just from the coaching element and like how well respected he was, that he was a learner, that he wanted to complete, continue to improve and to get better. And he wanted his team around him to get better with him, that he wanted to uplift people. And, um, you know, definitely didn't, I mean, hockey was what he was doing, but he understood that it was bigger than hockey. Right. And, uh, and I think that's a pretty wild thing. And his first question was always, what type of person is he? And, um, it's one of the things I say in this group all the time and on the podcast is I think that's the that's really the new evolution in hockey, I think, is is not only coaching the person behind the player, yeah. but like looking for the person behind the player, right? And it's going to help the player, but it's also going to help all these other things in the locker room, which you've spoke so eloquently about in, in your book. What do you think is the advantages of being a quality person? Like how to the message to the younger kids out there, like why why should they matter? Right, like why? Why does that matter? If if they're a really good stick handler, and if they're really good on the power player, they score points. Why does it matter what type of person they are, what type of teammate they are? Well, because that's how you win championships. And you could have the most skilled team ever developed with all bad characters, and they'll never win a championship because character really determines your success. And that's what Darcy always alluded to was that. But I think even carrying yourself and wanting to be a leader and be the captain of the team should be the highest regard. And not being the one with the most points. Mm-hmm. And I think that we lose sight in trying to find people who are getting the most points and not who is a captain, who's the heartbeat of the team, who leads by example the right way and not just lead by example. Because there's some people that lead by example, but it's the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And you want people who lead by example, which is the right way, which is doing everything right, following the drills, doing going past the line when you're doing your bag skate, not cutting corners. Like you want to be that good person. And it also dictates your future success in life. I know hockey is not a forever sport, 
and I wish it was, but it's not. And in the, ex in the real world, and when you get out and you're not playing sport, you need to have these life lessons that hockey teach, accountability, trust, respect, um, hard work. These are all life lessons that you need, even leadership too, to succeed in the world outside of sport. Yeah, you mentioned like our example is, is leading somebody. You know, like you might not even have a letter on your chest or you just walk through life, right? You you do something, somebody's watching, right? And that's going to have an impact somewhere. And that's one of the things that I try and talk about now is the whys, right? Like the why of what you're doing to really understand it. Because the community service is, is amazing, right? But like if you don't understand why, yeah. then it's just an action, right? Like, and I think that it sounds like Darcy was somebody that made you understand the why. Like why why is shoveling snow before this huge playoff game bigger and more important than that, than that game, right? And when you yeah. do understand the why, then you can go out and be curious about how else you can be of service or how who else you can support and who else you can touch. And I think that is where I think good coaching meets great coaching. Because when you can get the why down for those who are listening and those who are leading, then you got something. Because now they can make decisions without you being there. Yeah, 100%. And I think the why in life is huge too. And finding your path into life and why you do the things that you do. Like, why would I hold the door open to someone else? And it's because I want to actually help the other person with their day and hope that they are doing well and that this could maybe impact their day in a positive way instead of having the door be slammed on their face just before they get there. And why would I why I go out for community service? And it's because it truly helps me helping other people and it fuels my soul, makes me feel good to know I can put a smile on someone's face without expecting anything in return. And then even like lots of other things. Why do we even play hockey? And like, there's so many questions about, and you can, can search for those whys. And um, I think if we understand who we are as people and we are more self-aware, then we become better leaders too, because we know what works with us. We know what works within the team and being a good leader opens opportunities for the future, for sure. And the second that you aren't a good leader is the second the door starts to close. So that'd be a why you'd want to be a good leader and why you'd want to embrace being kind to others, treat others how you want to be treated is because your opportunity is open because people want good people on their team. And that's what people are looking for nowadays are better people than they are players. Yeah. Well, people are understanding culture. I mean, obviously, if you can have both, you mean in the hockey world, if you can have immense talent, have immense character, well, that's when you get like a Sidney Crosby, you know, like the, that, that's not an accident, you know, like the two go hand in hand. But yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. And, and why I love talking about the why too, is because yes, you can try and build your resume of, okay, I'm going to do this because somebody's going to like me for it. But like, if you understand why you're actually doing it, like who it's benefiting, how it's benefiting you and, and become authentic with those actions, that is when the phone picks up and, the, and the, like Jarcy's not the only one. What type of person is he? What type of teammate is he? Yes. What's he like when things are down, right? Who's he supporting? Um, where is he active? Like those things give you opportunities. And plus they allow you to become a better individual as a hockey player. Like you, you be, yeah, right. Like your, your traits allowed you to become a player that you probably otherwise wouldn't because you're able to look at, at things as how do I get better? How do I, how, how do I attack this day in a way that I'm going to leave it better than I started? Right. And that seems like that's a little bit of a philosophy you, you were, you were living with there, which I think is so impactful because if you build a, a dressing room with those types of guys, now you really got something. You talk about championships, right. Yeah. And you talk about family. Uh, that's the one thing with my, with the teams that I was on, the ones that did well were the ones that hung out together. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. They just did everything together, and yeah. you wanted to be with each other, and you wanted to enjoy your time with each other, and you actually cherished that time. Yeah, and not in groups, not in like the groups of three or four, right? Yeah. But like you said, together. Like, and and you said you 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 would you have to orchestrate those nights. So you have to be yeah. intentional about it because it doesn't just happen. It's not like oh, this year we got a good one. Like, right? it's like people yeah. pulling strings and like making sure that these events get organized, and then you start caring for each other. And when you start caring for each other, that's when really special stuff starts happening on the ice. And those are the moments, that, I mean, for sure, that I remember. Like the years, they don't always lead to championships. Sometimes you get close and you yeah. don't quite get there. Yeah. But those bonds and those relationships, you just can't take away. And that's the and that's really the best part of the whole sport, in my in my opinion. But sure. um, we want to talk about the family first with Darcy, maybe. You I mean, I think it's a... Uh, yeah it seemed to really be authentic and real. I mean, it's one thing to put something on a dressing room wall and I've been in those dressing rooms too, right? Yeah. It says perseverance, it says respect, it says this, but you don't, it's kind of hollow because you don't really hear it. It's not ingrained in the DNA of what's happening. 
But that was the first words on the wall for him was family first. And it sounds like that was really taken to heart. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. And I think for me personally, my family is the hockey family too. And I would always put my family, my parents and my actual family and also my hockey family first. And I think that Darcy was meaning more of just like your own families first as well. And I, there's nothing wrong with that because we all do come from different backgrounds, different grassroots. We all have different stories that make us the people that we are at that point in time. Because my story is not the same as someone else's story in that dressing room. And I think that's the cool, unique part about it is that we all come from different families and families should be first. And your teammates do become your family. And I think that I always put my teammates first. And even on our shirts, we had uh, we before me on the back of one of our t-shirts. And it's so true because we as a culture is always more powerful than me as a player. And if your team all buys in together, it's better than having one top player or a couple top players who think me is more important than the we. And so it was a buy-in and this idea of having us all go together towards one common goal and become a family and love each other and want to spend time with each other and actually support each other through the highs and lows because there's not going to be always highs in your season. You're always going to be doing well. And it's always the families that are there that are tight together that will support you throughout that time. Mm -hmm. So One of my, uh, well, not one of, my first pro roommate, Ryan Johnson, who's now involved with the Vancouver Canucks, uh, GM of their farm team and director of player personnel, went on and had an amazing pro career. But it was always kind of a fringe guy at the NHL level, right? Like, I shouldn't say fringe. Like, he, he had he always had contracts. Somebody always wanted him. But he was kind of the fourth line, third line guy. And, uh, and his approach and his character and the way he treated his teammates was what had him allowed him to have the longevity that he did. And one of the things that he said when he was dealing with the slump, which I thought was amazing because it was well beyond my emotional capability at the time, was that he would look across the room to find somebody else who was struggling. And he would put his focus on that person to try and lift them up. And in the idea of taking the eyes off himself, right, and whatever, trying to find answers or feeling sorry or yeah. finding for what's wrong, he would be trying to find what's right in that other person to help them. And that always lifted them both up, you know? And I was like, wow, what a crazy, awesome, compelling perspective. Because, like, isn't that what we're there for anyways? Like, he actually helps himself at the end of the day, but he's helping somebody else while doing it. Uh, and it seemed to me like that's almost like the way – you've approached some of the stuff in your life, correct? Exactly. Yeah. I find healing and helping others. And it is sometimes a weird concept to think, but me, like you said, me lifting them up lifts me up too, because I'm helping them, but they are helping me just as much by filling up my emotional bank and making me feel good and warm on the inside that I'm doing something good for them. And so it works both ways, I think. And that's a great example of somebody doing that. So. Yeah. There was um, the one story, and I can't remember the name that you gave them, but the four guys that you would drive. Oh, the taxi to the, crew. Yeah. The what, the what crew? Taxi crew. Yeah, the taxi crew. Yeah. So can you talk about the taxi crew? Because I think like for me, as far as embodying like respect and empathy and equality and inclusiveness and all these things that are like easy words to say, but maybe hard to enact. Like, I think that really encompasses all those things. And for you to come up with that on your own at that age, uh, to think that's a good idea and to enjoy doing it. And like, you know, to think that it's just the right thing to do. Can you talk about that? Cause I think that's a really awesome story. Thank you. Yeah. So for me, I was driving back from one of our exhibition games and I saw that uh, one of our super fans, and they are they are super fans of Broncos, Dallas had his bike that was broken in his chain, and um, he was walking back. And I just drove right by him, and I kind of was like, oh, that's Dallas, isn't it? So I stopped and turned around and went back. I was like, hey, um, do you need to ride back? Like, I see that you're walking your bike. He said, well, that'd be great. So I ended up hopping in my vehicle and uh, took him back. And I found out in the chat that he normally would bike to and from the games and that he wanted to be there early so he could see the opening face off and that sometimes the bus that they would normally get taken on sometimes leaves earlier because people have to go to bed earlier. So he was like, I, I usually try to bike or try to get a ride kind of thing afterwards so I can just stay for the full event. And I thought, oh, well, why don't I just take you? Like, would, would you be okay with coming to the game with me and then leaving afterwards? 
He's like, so what do you mean? I was like, well, I'd bring you to the game and then you'd be there about two hours early. It'd be a lot if you're okay with that. Then after I take you back probably like half an hour to an hour after the game. And he was like, I'm down. <laughs> I said, well, do you have any friends? Like, yeah, can I bring some friends? Like, sure. Just pack the vehicle, bring uh, three others and we'll load the vehicle and take you guys to and from every home game. And so he was like, oh, I can't wait. So throughout this, I he would call me every single game day. Uh, he'd be like, hey, I'm ready to get picked up at this time. And I'm like, yep, you bet. See you there. And uh, it was just super fun because it became part of my pregame ritual. But it was one of the highlights of every game day. It was picking up those guys. And uh, they all had, uh, they're all on Special Olympics hockey team or were a part of it in some capacity. And uh, so I got to really get know them on Monday nights when we did have Special Olympics floor hockey. And uh, then they'd also be a part of my taxi crew. So I'd pick them up every game day. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool experience. And uh, we got lots of good memories. I'd crank the tunes, we'd jam out, we'd hear them, their thoughts, their interviews with me, I interviewed them. Uh, I had to put them as a coach. It was just really fun to really make the most of them and just treat them like regular hockey fans who just love the Broncos. So, yeah, it was really special. That is special because I remember, I mean, I've been to those events, right? Like where you'll go to a home yeah. and meet people or you'll go to the hospital and meet the kids and there's something yeah. to put a jersey on and represent and be involved in the community. But to take it that next level and to really immerse yourself, right? To, to, to make it a part of things. I mean, that's that's super special, man. And uh, I mean, I'm going to say I'm proud of you for doing it, but I'm really it's like, well, I am proud of you for doing it, but it's like, it's, I don't know. Why is it so uncommon that people don't go in like that? You know? And uh, what was your why for that? Like speaking of why, yeah. right? Like why yeah. did you make that move to begin with and think that this was a good idea? A lot of times pregame preparation for hockey players is like super critical, right? Like to depend on somebody else and you have your set ways and now you're bringing four people in that you don't really know that are special needs. And you know yeah. what I mean? Like there's a lot of kind of things that people wouldn't go along with the ride for that. Yeah. And for me, it was just, how would I want to be in that situation? And I also thought like they are missing the best part of the game. They're missing the opening ceremonies and they're also missing if it goes in overtime. And I don't know if the, I don't know if he was even serious or joking about it, but I, I, about like the bus leaving early or the bus getting there late kind of thing. But either way, it was still a great time to get to know these people and actually build a bond with them. And I went to humble also with the intention to really be involved in the community and really want to give back because it is fuel for my soul. And I didn't feel complete in Notre Dame. I was assistant captain my nine year year. Going into my 20, I just still didn't feel right. I wanted to do my Dahlgren's Diabetes Program. And I wanted to really be invested in a community. And there's only 400 people in Wilcox. So there really wasn't many fans. You didn't have that really community aspect. So for me, Humboldt was like a really big choice for the community. And I really yeah. just to treat others how I want to be treated too. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, for those of you who haven't read the book too, yeah, I mean, Caleb made the choice to go to a bigger community, even though he was, you know, in a team that was, you know, being successful and he was a big part of it, but he wanted to be a part of this community where he could be more engaged in the community and, and get his uh, diabu diabetes um, program going and get some kids in there. And like, that's a super mature uh, choice to make at that age. I know you, uh, I think you're, we're pressed on time because I know you're a busy man. You got another interview, so I'll definitely respect that. Um I guess I'll close. I mean, I'm an only child too, uh, which which I didn't mention. But like, I, I what, hearing you talk about your teammates, and I think for us that probably means a little bit more. Like those guys in the locker room, because I didn't have a brother, I didn't have a sister, and those those were my boys. Those were my those were my brothers. In like figurative words, literal words, and and you know, like it's just that was my family. So I think that. Um, I definitely have special bonds through everyone uh, that I've played with, and uh, and I know that that team uh is going to leave a mark on us all and uh and i'm just so proud as actually i'll put one comment here from b caleb you're a force that is going to help so many people and already have keep it going man we are all we are all proud of you so thank you. um thank you yeah you're doing an amazing job you know the book is amazing for those of you who have not read it by all means do please read it i think at the back it says that you know part of uh, any of the of the proceeds goes to um the, the diet is it the diabetes the stars are ambulance. They oh, help the save lives. Yeah, help save yeah. lives on April six, and they literally save lives every day. So I wanted them to be recognized and thanked for all their support. So yeah, portion proceeds will be going to them.
Yeah. So if you didn't need any more motivation other than this might change your life, other than this might change your perspective or give you an idea about a belief system that you can, you know, digest and metabolize and use on your own. I mean, even the purchase of the book is going to help some people that help people every day. So, um, Caleb, you're doing amazing things. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with us here. And um, I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It was awesome chatting with you too. We have very similar mindset. So it's always nice to talk to someone like that. Have a great day, Caleb. Thank you, you too. Thanks so much for being here today for that powerful conversation with Caleb. Uh, Caleb, thanks again for taking the time. Uh, it's amazing, you know, how this interview even came to be in this day and age uh, that we were able to spend the 60 minutes together. I've never met Caleb before. Uh, we're able to connect over social media as much as I hate some aspects of social media. It is, uh, it is a great tool when used as such. And, and, now, and now you've had the opportunity uh, to hear Caleb in on my platform called up my hockey and you might not have otherwise had the opportunity to listen to him so uh my ability in whatever small way shape or form to help caleb spread his message and uh and get his book out there and who knows it could inspire one person it could change one person's perspective on something that's happened to them and help them to move forward and you know what caleb has done his job and i have done my job as well so very, very thankful for this conversation. I know for me personally, it has helped me. The book has helped me. Yes, I shed tears. Yes, there are emotions involved in this that aren't always construed as positive, but that's okay too, right? Like emotion lives within us and we are going to have sad days. Or we're going to have dark times. Uh, we need to allow that to happen, but we do at the core of it can know that we have the ability to use things how we see fit how we can keep our goals in mind how we can keep our dreams in mind how we can help others along on their dreams uh, and use things for good and uh, yeah I just love that reminder um, if Caleb can do it I'm sure I can do it and I'm sure you can do it because uh, life's gonna throw some curveballs and uh, we need a toolkit and we need a resiliency kit and survival kit to help us get through those the best way we can. And uh, one thing that I've learned uh, through this process of up my hockey and through this process of, you know, helping athletes uh, realize some goals and dreams is that one sure way out of your own personal suffering or your own personal turmoil is to help others, focus on others, focus on service, focus on on uplifting and whether you're an athlete uh, who's on a junior team whether you're a teacher or whether you're a construction worker it's the same thing you know like having that as being part of the dna of, of why we wake up is so helpful on a personal level so that was one of my big takeaways i'm sure there's others for all of you but um the one thing for sure is that get crossroads and read it and keep it on a shelf uh, and give it to somebody after you read it or encourage them to to buy it and give it to someone else after they read it because uh, it's good stuff and uh, and I think it's a tribute too. I don't think this is something that should be forgotten or uh, passed over. I know we're three years removed from the crash now and it's something that uh, I definitely remember on more days than, than just the anniversary because it is a, a reminder of purity. It's a reminder of, you know, uh, Pureness, you know, pureness just comes to mind. Like there's something so pure about that team going to that game, uh, trying to come back from a 3-1 deficit uh, and the prairies of Saskatchewan that just really strikes a chord. Uh, and I think that, I think that with that, with that emotional component involved in that crash, that uh, this book is such a great reminder of the tragedy that is, I mean, again, that is used to celebrate others. And that's what Caleb keeps talking about, like to celebrate those lives, to allow those lives to mean something, um, to live the life for them that they weren't able to live themselves. And I think the book is part of that. So that's it for today. Um, Caleb, once again, thank you so much. And thank you guys for listening. Till the end, play hard, keep your head up.